Well, you heard it here on the podcast throughout last week. The result of the Clemson game would ultimately define whether or not the 2023 season was a success or a failure. After Saturday, I think it's pretty clear. It was a failure. You are Locked On Irish, your daily podcast on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On Irish, your daily Notre Dame podcast. Today is Sunday, November 4th, and thank you for making this your first listen of the day. I'm your host, Tyler Wojak. I'm a Notre Dame alum and producer covering college football for Fox Sports. And this episode of Locked On Irish is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high-stakes wager for your small business. That's why LinkedIn Jobs has find the right people for your team faster and for free. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash Locked On College Terms and Conditions Apply. So I'm doing this a little bit different today. I'm getting this one up on a Sunday. And you know what we're going to talk about. Notre Dame's 31-23 to loss to Clemson on Saturday. And despite how negative my open was referring to the season as a failure, I'm honestly in a pretty good mood, which is shocking considering what Notre Dame looked like yesterday. And uh, I hope that today, if anything, I can sort of spread some goodwill and maybe make you feel a little bit better about the situation. And don't get me wrong, like, Yesterday was a disaster. It was an embarrassing performance by Notre Dame and really just a a really pathetic effort overall. And now the season is still a failure, but I think it was a healthy dose of reality of the situation. Now I've accepted it and it's a matter of dealing with it. And I hope we can all do the same here as we assess what happened on the field against Clemson, what went wrong throughout this season, and then start to look ahead to the future. So I'll go over some specifics on offense, defense, and special teams, because I think every single uh, unit contributed to the loss in some way. Obviously, the offense more than the rest, but I'll get into that. And then at the end, we'll talk about what's next for Notre Dame. What can they do left uh, in 2023? Can they sort of generate some momentum going forward? Because right now, there really isn't any momentum um, surrounding this Notre Dame football team. But let's let's start off on Saturday. And really, I look at Saturday's loss as like a, a microcosm of the season at large. And as I've been saying throughout this podcast so far, it's a failure. And the offense was most responsible for the failures in this game. That was the most glaring weakness by far. But the defense also contributed to the loss. Like, they played well overall. They aren't the reason that Notre Dame lost, but they were vulnerable in some key moments, and that certainly contributed uh, to the outcome. And the special teams... Again, not the reason that they lost, but they certainly did not do enough to help either side of the ball. Notre Dame was put in some really poor field position throughout the game. They had some line drive punts, obviously the muff punt by Chris Tyree that set up three points for Clemson. All of it contributed to the loss, but the offense is most responsible, and I think the offense has officially hit rock bottom. And maybe Notre Dame needed to hit rock bottom on offense in order for Marcus Freeman and really everyone affiliated with the Notre Dame football program to fully comprehend the severity of the issues on that side of the ball. Hopefully that's going to lead to some changes. I'm not saying that they need to fire Jared Parker right now or or make changes right now. Like I don't know. I'm not going to pretend to know the full um, complexities of everything that's going on in the offense behind closed doors, why they aren't having success. But I can look at the outcome on the field on Saturday and look at, Notre Dame's complete ineptitude throughout that game on the offensive side of the ball and say, hey, you know what? This isn't working. Something needs to change. Whether that's Parker reevaluating everything in his approach or Marcus Freeman deciding to make a move at offensive coordinator, that's up to them. But clearly, when Notre Dame had the ball, there was no hope that they were going to move it in any positive direction and get points throughout much of the second half. And I think when you hit rock bottom, it forces you to reflect and realize, okay, this isn't working, and you you gain a better perspective and awareness of the bad habits that got you to that point because once you reach that point, there's no escaping it. Like, there's no hiding from it anymore. You have to address the problem at hand, and maybe that's what Marcus Freeman and Notre Dame needed in order to make the necessary changes because if Notre Dame had finished the season 10-2, and like, let's say they beat Clemson, we'd obviously be in a much better mood today uh, talking about the season differently. They end up going to a New Year's Six Bowl. They probably would get beat by any good team that they face, because let's face it, this Notre Dame team is not that good. Clemson is not a very good team, and they looked like a 4-4 and team. They gave Notre Dame plenty of chances to win that game. Notre Dame was not able to take advantage of them. So if Notre Dame were to play a much better team in a New Year's Six Bowl, they likely would have gotten their asses handed to them, and that wouldn't have been a whole lot of fun either. But if Notre Dame had gone 10-2 in the regular season and then lost that New Year's Six Bowl game, 
maybe you could convince yourself that things weren't that bad and that you're just like a play here or a play here. Like if you're a play away from being a 11 and one or whatever, making the college football playoff, you aren't as incentivized to make those changes. But now that Notre Dame has hit rock bottom on offense, I think it's clear that they got to change something and maybe they'll address it in the buy or look at it a little bit more closely. But let's take a look at some of the stats on offense that show you just how bad it's been and why I think they really are at rock bottom. So it starts with the quarterback. Obviously, Sam Hartman had the worst game he's played in a Notre Dame uniform and probably one of the worst games he's ever had in his college career. He finished 13 of 30. 146 passing yards, zero passing touchdowns. He had two costly interceptions, including a pick six there. He did add 68 yards on the ground for a score, so he was trying his best, and he took all the blame after the loss. And while I respect it, I respect his leadership. His play on the field was simply unacceptable. And now there's a lot of people wondering, did we overrate Sam Hartman? Did we did we give him too much credit? Maybe, maybe. Um, but I also think that he's not the entire reason for these struggles on offense. Notre Dame had 55 total rushing yards in the second half after putting up 128 in the first half. And I understand that Notre Dame was playing from behind. You're not going to run the ball as much when you're trying to make up for a touchdown or two touchdown deficit. But still, they had opportunities to run the ball in that game. They didn't. When they did run the ball, it was the most predictable thing ever. Like They had success in the first half running the sweep to the right or the left, bringing a couple of pulling guards and the tackle um, and It was working early on. Audrick Estime had a bunch of rushing yards in the first half, and then Clemson adjusted, and Notre Dame didn't have an answer for that. It's like Notre Dame was stunned that Clemson figured it out. It's like, well, they figured it out. We don't have a plan B now, so we're just going to keep running it over and over and get stuffed to the line of scrimmage every time. That was unacceptable. Notre Dame went 3 of 13 on third down. This continues a trend of being one of the worst third down offenses in the entire country. That's not an exaggeration. Notre Dame is one of the worst third down offenses in the entire country, um, especially over the course of the past five games. And they had three costly turnovers, including the pick six I mentioned earlier. Notre Dame's leading wide receiver, um, not just wide receiver, tight ends, running backs included, was Rico Flores, who had one catch for 35 yards. Like, it's almost laughable how bad that is. And obviously without Mitchell Evans, who had been their leading receiver up to this point this season, that's a big loss. Chris Tyree, who was their leading wide receiver, had his worst game of the season. It wasn't just the muff punt. He also dropped a screen pass that I don't know if it would have been a touchdown because it was like 90 yards out, but it would have been a huge gain because it was right there and it just went right through his hands. So Really disappointing performance by him coming off a great game against Pittsburgh. But really, Notre Dame's offense still had so many chances despite how bad they had played for most of the the game. They were able to cut it to a one-possession game with 6.05 left in the third. Okay, the defense forced upon in the ensuing possession, and the Notre Dame offense got the ball back at their own four-yard line with two minutes and three seconds left in the quarter. They had six possessions from that point on to try and tie the game. Here is what they did. With those chances. Three and out. Then the next drive. Four plays and a punt. Three and out. Three and out. Interception. And then they had some miraculous attempt again there at the end after a crazy film off a fumble. They go six plays for 20 yards. Turnover on downs. And that, unfortunately, is the game. How many possessions do you think this team would have needed before they were able to finally score and tie the game? I'm putting the over-under at 100 Okay, and I might take the over because it was that bad for the offense at the end of the game. I know I'm being a little sarcastic there, but it was just ridiculous. Like, Notre Dame would get the ball and be like, oh, great. They're backed up in their own territory. Are they going to even be able to get this ball to, like, the 30? So, at the very least, maybe they could punt it and give themselves better position than uh, b- better field position the next time out, but they couldn't even do that. Um, I believe Tim O'Malley from Irish Illustrated pointed out they did not get past the 42-yard line on their own side of the field in the entire fourth quarter. It was just a, a terrible offensive effort, and there's a lot of blame to go around. But now that this game is behind us, I, I look at it as a, a win would have honestly been false hope. Like if Notre Dame somehow miraculously got that ball after the film off a fumble, scored a touchdown, take the game into overtime, and win this game, a game that they really did not deserve to win. And I'm not saying that Clemson definitely deserved to win either because they had a bunch of mistakes on their side of the ball as well. Basically, these are two terrible football teams. That's what it was like watching this game. It was like, these teams are bad, they're playing poorly, and somehow Notre Dame managed to stink more than the other team, and that's the reason they lost. But I just look at it as, okay, the offense is terrible. They did not do anything to help 
the defense and the special teams win this game. And ultimately, they lost. And now Marcus Freeman is forced to evaluate that side of the ball with a much more critical eye than he would have had to do if they had won. Because I know that Marcus Freeman likes to preach that they don't evaluate solely based on results and that they're critical um, of the process and not just the outcome. That's all great to say in a press conference after you win when you're talking about areas that you can improve upon. I get that. I don't think he's lying. I just think it's human nature that when you have any level of success, it's it's easier to avoid those tough decisions, those tough processes when you look at it and you're like, wait a second, like I know we won, but this is not good enough. It's kind of like... We could have said this after Notre Dame-USC, and we did to an extent, but it was a little bit different because Notre Dame's offense got the ball with such advantageous field possession so many times. But I think that was actually kind of a sign, like, hey, I know that they won, but they still didn't really move the ball that well in offense. Well, now you can't really escape it. Everyone saw it on Saturday. Notre Dame's offense is one of the worst in the entire country right now, and it involves the players for underperforming, but I really think it does start with the coaches and not putting the offense in any position to succeed because there's obviously issues with talent at wide receiver. When Sam Hartman plays that bad, it's going to be really tough. But Notre Dame has skilled players, and the offensive line played really well, and I still think they underperform. So I think overall that game is going to put a spotlight on all the problems Notre Dame has offensively, and it's going to force Marcus Freeman to consider all of his options. I don't know what the answer is right now, And I think it's going to take some time for Marcus Freeman and everyone to figure out what they need to do going forward. But clearly, they need to fix it, and they need to fix it in a hurry because this cannot continue over into next season because that would... That Notre Dame would not have any momentum going into 2024 if they keep things the way they are. So if there's any silver lining in this loss, I believe that Notre Dame is going to be forced to make some changes that will hopefully lead to much greater improvements on that side of the ball down the road than had they won this game in some crazy, miraculous fourth quarter or overtime comeback. So for as bad as the offense was, though, it wasn't entirely their fault that Notre Dame lost this game. The defense and special teams weren't able to help them out in some key moments. They also contributed to the loss. More on that coming up right after this. Now time for your Game Changer of the Week, brought to you by Athletic Brewing Company. Not a whole lot of Game Changers for Notre Dame this week. I've usually used Sam Hartman when doing this ad, but to be honest, if I had to pick a Game Changer for Notre Dame, it'd have to be Xavier Watts, right? Like, he's been playing out of his mind lately, and he seems to be the only player who's showing up week in and week out and making plays. I actually joke that Xavier Watts was Notre Dame's greatest offensive threat, despite the fact that he plays safety. So, in the same way that Xavier Watts has changed his game, Athletic Brewing Company has completely changed the non-alcoholic beer game. They make non-alcoholic beers that actually taste good. They're full of flavor and well-crafted, just like a full-strength beer. And you can find Athletic Brewing Company's non-alcoholic brews at a store near you, or buy online at athleticbrewing.com. First-time customers can use code Locked on to get 15% off your first online order. That's code locked on L O C K E D O N at checkout for 15% off at athleticbrewing.com. Near beer, exclusions and conditions apply. Athletic Brewing Company fit for all times. Before we continue, I wanted to remind you to please subscribe if you have not already. I really do appreciate every single person who tunes in for any episode, but especially one like today because it's not a fun time to be a Notre Dame fan right now. It's just not, but sometimes when things are going bad, the only thing that can make it better is community and being with others who are just as miserable as you, and that's what I'm here for. I'm hopefully able to improve the general mood today, even though Notre Dame is coming off their third loss this season. And uh, yeah, it's been a really disappointing year so far, but we're, we're in this together. We're doing it here, daily show, covering Notre Dame football, and hopefully we'll be rewarded for this down the road with some more wins uh, in the W column. But let's get back to the Clemson game. Let's talk about Notre Dame's defense because, again, I want to be clear when I say that the defense is not the reason why Notre Dame lost this game. But let's be honest. This was not the dominant defense we have come to expect from this group. Clemson was down several players, uh, specifically on the offensive line in this game. They were also without Will Shipley, their starting running back. And their offensive line unit pushed Notre Dame around. That was the most concerning part of the first half for me. Like, we expected the Notre Dame offense to struggle going up against a good Clemson defense. That was something that we can accept, right? But I could not understand how Clemson and their offensive line was getting such a significant push going up against Notre Dame's front seven because they have been so stout for this entire season, really. And Phil Maffa, their, the Clemson backup running back, Notre Dame made him look like the Doak Walker Award winner. Maffa finished with 36 carries, 186 yards, and two touchdowns. He, Notre Dame gave up another explosive run play for a touchdown. This one, a 41-yarder. That play, like, what are you doing, DJ Brown? Like, he comes in on the blitz, and it's a well-timed call. Like, if DJ Brown comes right off the tackle like he's supposed to in a run fit there when he's blitzing, 
That's a tackle for a loss in the backfield. Like, that's a great call by Al Golden. Instead, T.J. Brown takes it wide, goes right by the running back, and then Moffa can just walk to the end zone because the safety help that was there is no longer there, and it's just nothing but green grass ahead of him. He scores the touchdown, and that has been a problem so far for Notre Dame this season. In all of their losses, they have given up a critical run play, or two in the case of Louisville, where they just give up uh, the run fit, and then their running back is off to the races for a critical touchdown. They gave up the long run to Travion Henderson in the Ohio State game, two against Louisville, and now this uh, one by Phil Moffa against Clemson. The defensive line was getting pushed back, but it was also not a great time for linebackers Maris Leofow and J.D. Bertrand to have their worst games of the season. Um, really disappointed by their games, their performances overall. Maris Leofow actually got benched there for most of the second half when Jack Kaiser came in, and Jack Kaiser played really well in place of Maris Leofow, although even Jack Kaiser missed a couple tackles. So it was a really disappointing effort from them. Um, Benjamin Morrison had a couple plays as well. He got beat when he was using poor technique on a slant route there, getting close to the end zone. Cam Hart had a pass interference and a deep shot. Xavier Watts had a pass interference uh, in the end zone as well. Could that have been a no call? Maybe. But Howard Cross also missed a tackle for a loss when he was one-on-one with the running back in the hole. Just let him slip by him. So a lot of individual performances that were not up to standard of what we'd expect from the, the best players on this unit. When you have your best players in the, the side of the ball that you can count on the most when they're giving up big plays, uh, it's not going to bode well for you, especially when you're down from the jump like Notre Dame was in this one. But honestly, the most indefensible part of Notre Dame's defensive performance in this one was actually a decision by the coaching staff to put in their entire or almost entire second team uh, secondary in there when the score was just 10 to 6. Notre Dame had Jaden Mickey, Christian Gray, Clarence Lewis, and I believe Antonio Carter in at safety as well when the score was still 10 to 6. Klubnik proceeded to throw for 59 yards and a touchdown on that drive. Uh, their slot receiver beat Clarence Lewis. He just missed the tackle and they go in for a touchdown. And I understand that you want to rest your guys and you want to find spots during the game when you can give them a breather. I get that. But why not stagger the rest? If you're going to bring in Jade Mickey, why don't you leave in Cam Hart or vice versa? If you're going to bring in Clarence Lewis to play the nickel, why don't you keep the starters out there? Or if you want to bring in one safety, keep the other one out there. I don't know why Notre Dame needed to make um, a sweeping change and let them stay out there throughout that drive. When Clemson started picking them apart, they get the ball into the red zone. Why not just bring your starters back out onto the field where at that situation, the best you can do is hold them to a field goal. And then at least in that situation, it's only 13 to six and you're only down a touchdown. Instead, they stuck with that group. They let them score the touchdown. And now Notre Dame is down 17 to six early in the game. And you've just put your offense in an even worse situation because of your stubbornness or I don't know what you want to call it to keep them out there. Again, I understand you can't play the starters every single play, and you've got quality players behind them. You want to give opportunities to, especially in a big game like this. But letting them stay out there for the entire drive just made no sense to me, and uh, it it really was very costly for this Notre Dame team because then the rest of the way, they're fighting back from double digits down, and then we already know how bad the offense was, so you're just really not helping the cause. That is not playing complimentary football. Then later in the game, Notre Dame finally had some momentum when uh, Xavier Watts intercepted a pass on Clemson's opening drive of the second half. He brings it back to the two-yard line. Then Notre Dame is able to punch it in with Audra Kessemain. You're like, okay, really bad first half. Now the score is 24-16. There's basically a full half to play. You can hear the let's go Irish chants in the crowd. Like the team finally has some momentum. They get the big play they needed to, and you're thinking, okay, here we go. Lock in. Make those second-half adjustments. Notre Dame can still win this game comfortably if they're able to respond here with a stop, get the ball back, score. Whole new ball game, right? That's not what happened. The defense needed to stop there. Instead, they gave up an 11-play, 75-yard touchdown drive uh, to go back down two scores, and that is just not going to cut it. I know that this defense isn't perfect, and Clemson had some changes of their own, and they came out with second-half adjustments too. Like I realized that they watched film too, but... In that situation, going up against a Clemson offense who has a struggling quarterback, like Kate Klubnick did nothing in this game to really earn them the win. The fact that he got the win after going 13 of 26 for 109 yards passing with a touchdown and interception and a fumble, that's ridiculous that he's the winning quarterback in that one. But still, the Notre Dame defense relented in a very key moment, and that is something that we have actually seen a lot this season. Again, the defense has played really well overall, but they've been vulnerable in key moments. 
Um, just think about that Louisville game in the second half. They gave up those explosive run plays I was talking about. They were getting gashed on first down. The Ohio State game, they needed just one stop there at the end. They weren't able to come up with it. And here we are again in the Clemson game. Even though they were able to make some stops there at the end, they allowed the game to get out of hand because they gave up a key touchdown when Notre Dame finally had some momentum to an offense that has been struggling mightily all season long. Like, with the injuries that they have and the lack of elite quarterback play, Notre Dame should have been able to come up with a stop in that situation, and instead they didn't, and the offense was forced to try to come from behind the rest of the way, and obviously they weren't able to because they just can't seem to do anything right on that side of the ball. And thirdly, special teams, again, not the reason they lost, but they didn't really do anything to help Notre Dame either. They really put them in a difficult situation when Chris Tyree muffed that punt early on in the game. Fortunately, the Notre Dame defense was able to hold them to a field goal. Um, I thought Spencer Schrader was the lone bright spot for special teams in this game. He went three for three on field goals. But the fact that Notre Dame was kicking field goals in those situations was really frustrating because Notre Dame was actually moving the ball well early on in the game, and then they'd get into the red zone, they weren't able to capitalize, and they settle for field goals. Like, I understand you want to get points on the board and you trust Spencer to make it, but I really felt like Notre Dame could have been a little bit more aggressive there. And really, especially in the second half, Notre Dame got crushed in the field position battle. Bryce McPherson got a lot of work in this one, and he did not always make the most of it. He had a couple line drive punts, and it seemed like Clemson was always able to get a few extra yards after the return. Notre Dame's punt coverage unit was not great. And then on the other side, Clemson's punter, and even Kate Klubnick, who got in the action with a quick punt, they had an outstanding game. Aiden Swanson finished the game with six punts for 265 yards, five down inside the 20, including a long of 57. Notre Dame didn't try to block it one time, and Notre Dame continued to get the ball with very unfortunate field position, which gave their offense little to no chance because even if they had gotten the ball at the 50, the best they probably could have done was maybe one first down or two and get a field goal. But at that point of the game, Notre Dame was not going to drive down the field 90 yards for a touchdown. So all three phases played a part. Offense certainly more than the rest, but still the defense and special teams were not able to come up and make some plays when they needed to. So Notre Dame is what they are right now. They're a 7-3 and football team. They deserve to lose that game on Saturday. And now we have to look ahead to the last two regular season games and the bowl game and try to figure out what's left for Notre Dame to accomplish in the 2023 season. And that is coming up right after this. This episode is sponsored by LinkedIn Jobs. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high-stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available, and that's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs also find the right people for your team faster and for free. I used LinkedIn Jobs a few years back. They made it easy to contact the hiring manager, learn more about the role, and eventually, I got the job. LinkedIn also makes it incredibly easy to create a free job post on LinkedIn Jobs. All you have to do is add your job and the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. We all know hiring can be time-consuming, but adding the right team member can be invaluable to your business, and LinkedIn Jobs makes it easier than ever. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash lockdowncollege. That's linkedin.com slash lockdowncollege to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. So coming out of that loss, a lot of people are questioning what Notre Dame is supposed to do the rest of the way. How do they finish this season? Do they make a change at quarterback? Do they make a change at offensive coordinator? There's a lot of big picture questions going on right now, especially considering the fact that Notre Dame is heading into a bye, which is so weird at this point in the season. I really wish that was not the case. But the fact of the matter is they need to finish 9-3. and I know that won't mean a ton. We're not going to be super happy about it at the end of this season. But it is absolutely imperative that the wheels do not come off and that they finish the season 9-3. and It does not become like a complete disaster here on the way out of the season. If they can finish 9-3, and get into a decent bowl game, maybe beat a you know, semi-decent team, they get 10 wins, even though I think when you get your 10th win in the bowl game, it's a lot cheaper than if you got it in the regular season. It just I don't think all 10 win seasons are the same, and certainly not if you get that win in the bowl game against like a terrible opponent who's probably not even playing all their starters. But still, they cannot let the wheels come off. They need to finish that way. And then they still need to make all these changes at the end of the season. But I I really think Notre Dame needs to focus on just winning these last two, playing the best players, and uh, making sure that they get these two wins against teams who aren't as talented as Notre Dame. Like Wake Forest and Sanford, Notre Dame is much better than both of them. But they're feisty, and they're going to put up a fight. Like, I do not expect these two games to be a cakewalk. And as for the quarterback situation, I'll come out and say it right now. I believe Sam Hartman should definitely start the next two games. Bowl game, 
that's a different story. But you owe it to the team. You owe it to the veterans. You owe it to the seniors to put out the best players in the regular season and let them play um, because that's what they signed up for. Marcus Freeman brings it up all the time. You have 12 guaranteed opportunities. You need to give it your all for those 12 games. I understand the opposing argument. I understand that people are like, well, you need to let you see what you have with Steve Angeli. Um, you see him every day in practice, and you can see him in the bowl game maybe. But if, if you bench Sam Hartman, a leader on the team, who is clearly the better quarterback right now than Steve Angeli, despite the fact that he played a really poor game on Saturday, it sends a terrible message to the team. It sends a terrible message to the leaders of this group. And I would counter that with, okay, if you are benching Sam Hartman for the future, even though you know it's going to negatively impact the team, would you be okay with Joe Alt deciding to sit out these last two regular games so he can prepare for his future? Because I think it's the same thing. And I don't think you'd be okay with if Joe Alt did that. I'll, I'm not saying Joe Alt would ever do that, but if you're thinking, all right, well, this season's done, we got to start planning ahead for the future, you make that decision and Joe Walt is like, all right, well, I'm going to do the same. You can't have one and not the other. And I really don't want that to happen, and I think that'd just be a gross precedent to set, and it would just be a really bad message to the rest of the team. So win these next two games, give it your best effort, win on senior day, let the seniors go out with a W, go on the road, take pair of business against Stanford, and then potentially go out on a high note in the bowl game. Because even though it's not going to be a, a you know a major bowl game or anything like that, we're not going to end the major bowl streak. I still think that winning a bowl game and, and winning the se- or ending the season on a three game winning streak would help a little bit heading into the off season because they would still need to make all these changes that I was referring to in the beginning of the episode, talking about the offense and what they need to figure out and other, you know, whether it be transfer portal options, recruiting, things like that. They still need to make all of those, but if they're able to do it with a nine and three record, I think it just, it feels a lot better going into next season and you can convince yourself that, all right, look, last season was bad. We made the necessary changes, but still we aren't that far away from getting to where uh, we want to be. But if you let the wheels come off, you finish the season eight and four, potentially even seven and five, then it's a complete disaster. And the whole off season is going to be absolutely miserable and not fun for anyone. So really you're just trying to avoid that, which is not a great place to be when you're just trying to avoid the worst case scenario. But that is the situation that Notre Dame is in right now. It's not a lot of fun, but like I said, the silver lining here is that Notre Dame is finally in a position where I think you have no running. You can't run. You can't hide. You have to address the problems at hand. And I am hopeful that Marcus Freeman is going to be able to do that. He's going to figure out what needs to be done. And then he's going to take the action necessary to get that done and get this team back in the right direction. Because I still think there's a lot of talent on this roster. This team can have a bright future, but they got to make some changes along the way. And it's on Marcus Freeman to make those changes. That's going to do it for this episode. Thanks again for making this your first listen today. Uh, I really cannot thank you enough for making it through this episode. I've been saying it throughout the show. This is a really tough time for Notre Dame fans, but we're going to get through it. We're going to be back tomorrow with Luke Smith to put this game to bed once and for all. Then we'll shift gears later in the week to some more big picture stuff heading into the bye. Before you go, please subscribe on YouTube or wherever you're listening to the podcast and follow the show on social media. The Twitter is at Lockdown Irish. Instagram is at Lockdown Irish Pod. And my personal Twitter is at Tyler, W-O-J-C-I-A-K. I will see you guys on Tuesday.